Hello from me. I, I'm Steve, and I've been in charge of the, the, the Rockerville Turn project for too many years, at somewhere between 25 and 30, can't quite remember, but a long time. And it, I say it's been a really successful project. So look, I'm going to introduce the island a little bit, show you around, and then I'm going to go into a talk I prepared about a year ago, but I have updated that talk with all this year's facts and figures. So it's, it's totally up to date, but it, it's, it's a bit of work I did for, to celebrate the end of the of European Union funding that we'd had for five years up to 2020. So I'm gonna give most of that talk again. And then there's a few more extra slides at the end of birds and people doing things and all, all sorts of stuff. So I say, put your questions in the chat box. We might open it up a little bit and, and let you ask them. We'll see how things go towards the end. Now it's very, now I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to turn my camera off, maybe, oh, it doesn't really matter. Get rid of that. Okay, Rockerville. What is it? It's a tiny island. Apparently it's about 0.9 of a hectare. Most of it is covered by a lighthouse and a lot of buildings. So there's very little sort of solid ground. It's, it's an outcrop of, of ancient, rock Caledonian granite. It's about six kilometers off the North Dublin coast, adjacent to Skerries. And this view here at sunrise is looking from Skerries towards the island. But there's a bit of a telephoto in there, so it looks a hell of a lot closer than it really is. It is quite a remote place, given it is technically part of County Dublin. OK, and what is it famous for? Obviously, it's turns. And it, like Andrew said, and I, I agree, it is probably one of our best long running conservation success stories. I lo I'm a little bit biased and people who look after the phalaropes and the corn crakes and whatever, they all might be a different perspective, but certainly on the seabirds, it, it's an amazing place. We have so many birds in it and it is tiny. And that's the, the thing about it. It has all this bird life on a very, very small island. And obviously, uh, the, the most brilliant birds we have there are the rosier terns. And this tiny island supports about something between about 60 and 80% of Europe's rosier terns. Okay, so all the other colonies, they, they are about 20% next to nothing. Everything happens on rock. Now, here we go. Okay, so if you the left hand shot there is, is from an airplane, there's an aerial view. It can look as though it's one island most of the time. And at very low spring tide, the two halves of Rockerville are actually joined, and you can just about scramble over the rocks from one to the other. So, what you see in the left hand shot, the right hand thing with the lighthouse and the buildings, it's called the rock, and the left hand lump of rock. It's called the bill, and together they are rocker bill. And if we look at a Google image there on the right, you can just about see there is a, I'll, I'll use my arrow, I don't know whether you can see it. There's a channel there. It's probably about 30 or 40 yards across. It's not, not very much, maybe less than that, 20 yards, depending on the tide. So the two things together are rocker bill. And while I have this shot, I'll just explain that most of the rosy and common terns are on this island, on the rock. And until very recently, most of our Arctic terns, the three species, were on the bill. But things have changed, and the number of, of big gulls, and by big gulls, I mean the great black gulls and herring gulls, have increased dramatically out on the island. And the numbers that use the the right-hand island, the, sorry, the, the top island there, the bill, have increased dramatically and they have a very negative effect on the terns because it is a separate island and except on, on rare spring tides, the only way we can get over there is in a little dinghy and we can't do that every day if the weather's bad. So unfortunately, the gulls get a lot of the turn nests on the small island. We live on 
the lighthouse tile and, and there we managed to keep them off pretty effectively and that's where we've seen the greatest growth. Although we've lost a lot of our Arctic terns from here, some of them have moved to various sites on the rock itself, so we're better able to look after them there. Now, the first thing you'll ask, is, how do we get there? Now, this is a bit of an eye wish on the left. That, that, that's how the Irish lights guys get out to the island, or they did until very recently. And occasionally a warden or two might have sneaked off on a helicopter for a quick fly. But normally it's a boat, I'm afraid. And we either go out from Malahide or Skerries or sometimes Rogerstown or places like that. And I, I, I'm being a bit over dramatic there. Our boat is normally a little bit bigger than that dinghy. It's more like the rib in the background you see there in the back. But we use this little dinghy to get between the two islands when the weather isn't too bad. It takes us usually about 40 minutes in the boat to get out to the island. And normally we'd be going out with tons of water and food and equipment and all sorts of stuff, diesel for the generator, gas for the cooker and so on and so forth. So we've normally got a full boat, and then obviously project staff. But let's talk about the birds now. And we'll come back to the people and how we live later on in the tour. Ro Rockabilly, I say, it's principally a turn colony with three species. So that's the, the, the three on the right. At the top, we have the common term. Uh, lower middle, this one, is the roseate tern, and this one on the bottom right is the arctic tern. Superficially, they all look the same. They all look sort of black-headed, grey-white, with a long tail and palish, reddish-orangey legs, but there are some subtle differences, and this is what I want you to try and pick out. Starting with the roseate, obviously, here, it has a black bill sort of pure black, certainly for the first couple of months that turns are with us in April and in March, sorry, March, in May and June, but later in the summer, towards the end of June and July and August, the bill becomes red a little bit. Now I've lost my pointer here. Base of the bill, okay? So that bit can be red. Compared with a common turn, it has, a red and a blacky brown bill, blackish bit at the tip. So this is actually a common turn which has quite a lot of dark blacky brown. On the end of the bill, it can be quite a small bit, just the, the tip would be dark, but it varies a lot. And overall, the bird has probably a shorter tail. And it's less white. It's more of a gray bird than a white bird. When you see them in the sun, this bird looks pure white and this one looks white. The Arctic tern is closest to the common tern, but there's always a difference in the bill. And in this case, the bill is, is slightly shorter than the other two species, and it is all red. Quite a dark red, but it is all red. They have much shorter legs than the other two species. It's quite hard to tell. So it looks quite a sort of dumpy bird, and it has a tail that's a, somewhat in between the length of the roseate and the common tern, and it is also a, a grey looking tern when it's flying around. So we've got one very brilliant white one with a black bill, the roseate, and the other two often cause more problems for people to identify. But also nesting on the island, we have two other seabirds. The, the kittiwake, the top left hand one, it's one of the smallest gulls we have in Ireland. It is on the, on the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, red list. So it's, it's globally endangered. But we have a population of about 150 to 200 pairs nesting on Rockabill. They're good gulls. They're not like the bad gulls, which are the, the blackbacks and whatever that we'll talk about in a minute. So they're good gulls. They don't harm anything. At the bottom left, you can see a pair of black limots. These are largely black birds. They have a, a big white wing patch. They have bright red legs, which you can just about see a hint of underwater there. And the one telling thing is when they do open the mouth to, to call, their, their, their inner mouth is bright red. 
okay so an iceberg and we have somewhere between 50 and 90 pairs of them nesting on the island together with all the terns okay that's not to say we don't see other seabirds there because we have some big colonies around us on Lambe Island and and in the Skerries on the Skerries Islands so we have the whole range of Irish seabirds can be in or around Rockabill. Quite often they might land on the island, so we could get puffins landing on the island, guillemots, razorbills, and whatever. We have hundreds of gannets flying past the place every day. So we see all the seabirds, but we have five special ones that nest on the island. So now I'm, I'm, I'm launching into to this sort of talk that I, I prepared a year ago to sort of say, why is Rockabill so important? How has it come about that what was formerly a much more widespread bird, there might have been 20 or 30 colonies of rosier terns in, in Britain and Ireland and northern France 30 or 40 years ago, but now there's literally, there's only two in Ireland, one in England, and one significant one in France. And there are three or four other places where we get one or two pairs nesting. So what is it about Rockabill that makes it so special? And is it anything to do with what we've done or is it just the birds, you know, and or how we work together to create this amazing spectacle, okay? So we're gonna go through what we do when we go out to the island in the spring. I don't know why the slides are shooting off on their own here. Um, I'm not touching anything, but they're <laughs> clicking on. Okay, so what we do, to look after the place for these birds. We get out there usually the end of April or very early May. I'm just going to let somebody in. There we go. Hopefully on a nice day when the sea is relatively calm because we have tons and tons of equipment and we get to the island and it is a very green and lush place. And you think, where the heck are we going to get three and a half thousand pairs of turns to nest when you look at this forest of vegetation and it is really dominated by one species? This one on the left hand shot here is tree mallow, and it, it literally does what it is it can be up to about six foot tall and it can have a stem or a trunk that's about five centimeters in diameter. So it's very beautiful, but unfortunately it takes over the whole island and there's no space for anything. So you'll see in the next slide or two what we have to do. There's another flower here. It's a, it's a shrub, it's a hebe, it, it's been planted. There's a little bit of a hedge along one of the gardens on the island. And that's it. It's, it's good for holding migrant birds, little birds, warblers and whatever that come into the island. They often seek shelter in the Hebe and when I'll talk a little more about the other birds that are found on and around the island we have one or two other species that occasionally breed there they're not seabirds one is the blackbird and it has its nest in the Hebe bushes in this garden okay so our first job on the island is to remove most of the vegetation we don't rip it up, lock, stock and barrel, because if we did that, we'd remove most of the soil and soil is a very precious thing on the island. So what we do is we clip off the vegetation at ground level. It'd be lovely if there was some sort of amazing mower that would do it for us. But literally it's on your hands and knees with a pair of, of, of clippers or loppers cutting this thing. And I tell you, it, it can be two inches or five centimeters in diameter. And then we have to cart it all the way out of the way. We have some enormous compost heaps. We actually put some of it in the sea. <coughs> if you use it to make their nests with. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a lot of lugging of vegetation, getting it out of the way onto our compost heaps, whatever. So we drag it and often great big drag bags. Now, I don't know why this is happening. And then we have a bit of space on the island. We do leave some of the tree mallow around, 
it, it does pr provide a little bit of natural shelter for other species to, and sometimes the chicks can hide under it but i'm afraid we have to clear 90 percent of it so that we can get out the most important thing for the rosy terns which are the nest boxes we supply and nest boxes i mean nest boxes we we have over 900 of these things so we literally have to get them out of storage we have to clean them up repair them if they've collapsed fall to bits or something during the winter months sort them all out they're all numbered there's a pile there that the pyramid are brand new ones that we're about to put new numbers on to slot them into places where we've lost a box or it's it's, it's too old and the, the woodworm has rendered it useless so and then we have to get them out into the colony some of the boxes no i don't know this is where it's got a mind of its own it's a computer some of the boxes go in exactly the same place this is every year and they, and they are in areas that we call study areas so these are ones where we put the same box in the same place every year and we follow in incredible detail what happens to those birds they, they form a sample of, of probably about 20, 25% of all the birds on the island. And in, when I mean we follow them, we, we check them probably twice a day. So it's about five or 600 nests that we've been checking every day, myself and the three wardens that work with me and spend the whole summer there, okay? The rest of the island, uh, the boxes get spread out over the island. Over the years, we've learned not to put them in areas the terns don't like. So we put more in the areas they really do like. And sometimes there isn't enough space. So what we've actually done is to make artificial terraces and we can actually get more nest boxes into the same piece of land if we make these stepped terraces, like the, the middle picture you can see there. So that, that, that's the sort of thing we do before the season starts or after the season is finished, we might be setting up some new terraces for the following year to get more boxes in. And I say at the moment, we have, I think have about 930 or maybe more, 970 boxes out void on Rockville. The bottom right-hand picture shows one of our study areas. And this is where the, bo the boxes, the same boxes, the same number, as are in the same place and we follow who nests in them and i say a lot of detail about what happens to their eggs and chicks these study areas are dotted around the island and we usually have a hide very close to them so we can see what's going on and we can obviously stay out of sight and stay dry if it's wet and all the all the nest boxes are laid out so they face the hide so we can actually see what's going on in other areas we tend to let the nest boxes out to sea because that's where the birds are going to get their food. So that's some of the stuff we do for the terns, nest boxes, clearing the vegetation. Common terns will only nest in the open, so they need everything cleared for them. About half our rosettes nest in boxes, but the other half also just nest out in the open. And it's quite often beside a box, behind a box, not far from a box, but I say not all of them are in boxes. Whereas all of the common terns are out in the open, all the Arctic terns are out in the open. And what they are vulnerable to are things like these great backpack gulls, of which we have an increasing number of them hanging around the island. So we, we do a lot of chasing, and literally it is chasing, occasionally throwing stones at them. And but most of the time they know their place and that's over on the bill. But even on the bill, we would like to get the numbers down so we can get the, the Arctic terns nesting there again, but it's proving very hard to do that. And we have a, a little gadget that's like late, a little laser gun. We find early in the morning in the half light and the same at sunset, if we waggle the laser around, not, not dazzling them in the eye, but around their feet, we have a little green beam and we dance the green beam around the feet 
and this makes them very unsettled and they wonder what on earth's going on here you know i can see something but i can't feel it or whatever and quite often they will fly away but they usually do return because it, it doesn't do do them any harm it sort of unsettles them for a little bit of time but not not permanently so we, we have to spend a fair bit of time chasing goals I'd rather do something else i tell you oh, come on okay so i say we get out there beginning of may the turns usually arrive in, in the first second week of may and usually by about the third week of may the first eggs start to appear literally once one starts they all start and it's very quick over the period of about a week we go from no nests to thousands of nests each egg is usually laid at about two day intervals the common terns lay three eggs normally the rosy terns lay either one or two eggs and most arctic terns lay two eggs so there, there's a the range, but usually there's two days now I'll go two days between each egg. So it takes up to a week for the, the commons to lay their full clutch. And quite often they don't sit on them the minute they lay the first one. So they will could lay two, and it's only then that they start sitting on the eggs. And that, that's where the gulls get an opportunity to try and nick them. So we're very busy with the gull scaring early on. Now, the, the nests I've shown up here in the top left is a very unusual one. It's actually a, a three egg arctic turn nest, and it's what we call an erythristic clutch, which means it's very red colored. Most turn nests, and I'll show you, you'll see a few others later on, they're, they're sort of creamy, olivey, green with, with dark spotting. But for arctic terns, they can sometimes be red, they can sometimes be blue, and they can sometimes be gr real green or turquoise so a lot of variation mostly in the arctics the others are, are more similar they sit on their eggs they incubate them for about three weeks 22 days is probably the, the norm then we start seeing little little cracks in the eggs and literally within a day or two chicks for us certainly within our study areas we mark sorry we ring the chicks as soon as we can that's sometimes the day they hatch or the next day we get rings on those birds so we can tell you know which day they were hatched and which nest they're in because later on and particularly for the for the common terns the chicks start running around a bit and we're trying to follow a specific egg chick through to fledging we want to know how many from each uh, clutch survive to fledge and so on so we, we have them all marked these tiny little metal rings you'll see a bit more of them so this is a picture of us ringing away we don't do the whole island on those first few days for the one the birds that are not in study areas we then ring them in something where it turned into a thing an event we call a ringing blitz when some of my colleagues from birdwatch and other bird ringers come out to help us and we sweep around the whole island and ring virtually every chick we can get our hands on. So I've missed out a little bit at the bottom left there where I say we mark nests. So each nest, if it's in a box, it has a number anyway, but for an open nest, they all get a, a little plastic clothes peg. In the case of rosettes, they're all numbered. Commons, we don't number them all, but, but rosettes and arctic terns, we would have numbered pegs so we can recognize each nest and follow it through but for the commons there's just so many we don't we don't mark them all individually or well, we mark the nest but not num number them all these re re ring chicks i say we, our aim is to ring every chick on the island sometimes a few get away you know they hide too well or they run too fast or whatever or we run out of rings and we're waiting for a delivery of rings and and some birds start to fledge but what, what it means is that when these birds come back to the colony usually when they're about three years old to breed they're already they know who they are and where they came from spend a lot of time doing what we call ring reading and you can see a one there on the top right with a telescope she is actually trying to read 
the the ring number on on a bird somewhere down below her below that helide which is is what she's squatting on we normally do most of this work from hides and you can see a hide to the right there the bottom right but in that case she was trying to get the ring of a bird a bit further away and and she's i say that the birds are so tame we don't really need the hides or and obviously we're very interested in what terns eat and relate that to how well they survive the species they eat the size of the fish and we can work out the energy content of a fish and so we spend a lot of time looking at fish and i put in a very weird thing right i really don't know what it is anyway but that, that's not normal prey very nice next one so that, on the right bottom right here this is what a rosy turn nest looks like inside a box so you can just see the back of the box there so literally there's no real nest there might be a slight depression which holds the egg or eggs for a rosy turn it's one or two of this pale creamy color with fairly fine speckling on them okay and when they hatch you get this thing out of them and this is what we call a little punk rocker here that they're they look as though they're, they're soaking wet. They are a, a little bit damp to start with, but they're very spiky. Common turn, it does look a little damp as well the minute it hatches, but it soon becomes a sort of really gorgeous, fluffy thing. This guy stays this sort of spiky punk rocker look for a few days, and then, and then it becomes a, more of a, a normal turn. How we tell the two species apart, it's that look. And also, rosy turn chicks have dark grey legs. Common turn chicks have pink or orange legs. So, uh, started the Rockville Turn Project in 1989, and that was the, the, the year after the Irish Lights Keepers left full time residence on the island so they automated the lighthouse and abandoned it really in 1988 and we got the funds and the go ahead to move at that time usually two wardens and and, and some bosses like me out to the island to look after the turns the beginning of may through through till august so when 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 we started the project we we felt we had less than 200 pairs of both common and roseate turns okay so this is this point right here the blue line is the nest count over the years and for roseates there's been growth there's been periods of, of relative stability and then another burst of growth and uh, really for the last sort of 10 15 years they've been going up with a little bit of a hiccup a few years ago but this year they reached an all-time record level of 1,704 pairs of rosier turns on the island. So it's incredible. So from 180 down here to 1,700, nearly tenfold, what is it, tenfold, hundredfold, I don't know, a massive increase. The red line here, oh, we're jumping around. Is what we call the productivity of the turns and this is the number of turn chicks fledged per laying pair okay so this out if it's a rosy turn and they lay one or two eggs it's how many of those survive to fledge at the end of the season and that's averaged across all all the birds and the colony obviously so the numbers, what I've done is I've, I've multiplied productivity by a thousand. Productivity for a rosy turn is normally somewhere between about half 0.5 and 1.5. So times a thousand, that's wherever we are, 500 here. And 1500 or so up here. But it generally means that up here, above this line, they've raised more than one chick per pair below it less than one chick what we can see is it generally it's been pretty high but there's been a trend over the last 10 or so years for it to go down so as the number of pairs have gone up 
the number of, the, the number of young they raise has gone down. And if you actually do the maths, the same number of, of young birds are leaving the colony, but each pair is contributing less to that, but we have more pairs. But I say this trend, downward trend had me really worried up to last year, but this year we had a really good year and it's back up to 1.23 or something. So I am much happier now that we've, we've stopped this horrible downward trend. Now, if we, if we, sorry, go to the next one and look at common terns, again, remember we started just around the 200 mark, 1989. Again, a more smooth increase up to 2,200 and something up here. And it jiggled around over 2000 for, for quite a few years, five, six years. But then in the last few years, it has started to creep down a little bit. And I think this has to be a function of the productivity for these birds, which has actually gone down and down and down, more or less consistent. So numbers up and it's, they've stayed relatively stable close to the 2000 mark, a hint of a decrease now. And, but the productivity is generally very poor. So most common terms raise less than one young per pair. It obviously is enough to keep the populations stable, but I'm a little worried here that it is, we've had too many bad years so that the number of breeding birds is beginning to go down a little bit. But anyway, there's not a lot we can do. Now, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get all the all the numbers, the graphs out of the way in, in a block in the middle, and then, then I can get back to the nicer pictures. Here, what, what I'm trying to show, this is what, what we learn from bringing these birds when they're tiny chicks, okay? So what, what I've said, we spend a lot of time with telescopes, sitting in the hides or wandering around the colony, trying to read the numbers on those little rings, okay? And once we've got that, we can work out how old they are because they're all ringed as chicks and where they come from and what we see in this bottom left hand table here for rosier terns is that of of the 578 we read into this year 2021 nearly 96 percent of them were for rockmobile less than four percent of them were from the other irish colony Ladies Island Lake down in Wexford, and a tiny number, 0.35%, were from Coquit Island in Northumberland in England. That there, and those I told you are the three main British and Irish colonies. And we have a couple of other colonies in France. One has about 40 or 50 pairs, and another one has a handful of birds. So literally these three plus the main French one on an island called Ilo Mouton are, are virtually all of the Northwest European rosier terns. But also I said, of all these birds here, we know exactly how old they are. They're all ringed as chicks. So for rosier terns, the graph at the top shows you the most common age of the breeding birds in 2021. And it was five, uh, sorry, six years old, birds raised in 2015, okay? So the, these were the, the oldest, sorry, they're not the oldest, the most common age of breeding birds. Most rosy terns wouldn't breed before they're three years old. So, so in 2021, you can see we ha have virtually no two-year-old birds. Birds, some three-year-old birds. Actually, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm telling the truth there. That that's wrong. This is 2020. It doesn't really matter. I say the birds. I think were mostly five years old. Got virtually no first-year birds. A few second-year birds, and then the year they really start breeding is when they're three, i.e., 2017. And if we look at the same for common terns. The most common breeding age was actually nine or ten years old here. So that they, they see, seem to start breeding a bit later, common terns, 
And what you can also tell, the oldest bird hatched in 1998. So that's 22 or 23 years old. And over here for a rosier tern, it was hatched in 1993. And that is 28 years old, 20, not 28 years old. So they are exceptional. You can see very few get over 20 years old, but a few do, both commons and roseates. And it looks like they could live up to about 30 years of age. Now, I said food is, is obviously a key to, to raising chicks, a good supply of small fish that the terns can give to their chicks. And in Ireland, this mostly means two or three species of fish. One is the is sand eel, and another is, is, is probably a mixture of two species that we call clupeids, and the, these are the sprat and the herring. They're very oil rich for both sand eels and the clupeids, sp sprat, herring, are very energy rich fish, okay? And the rositerns more or less solely eat these two species. So you can see most years you see a sort of orange bar and a blue bar, and occasionally there's a bit of gray or another color at the top. Early on when we started this study in the, the mid 1990s, there seemed to be a bit more variability and some other species were used then, but they've just sort of disappeared. And it's always the clupeids and sand eels that dominate the diet. These are fish that turn to bring in to feed their chicks. And how we, we monitor this, it's by doing three all day watches. We, we, we monitor, I put 15 down there on the right, but sometimes it can be 20 or 25 nests. And from five o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, we count every fish that's brought into those nests. Pool all that data and you get this spectrum of what's eaten across the years, over, over 25 years or whatever it is. I say it looks like there's periods when sand eels were rising in importance, then they started declining and sprats and herring took over. And then the sand eels started increasing again up here. But it, it looks a little more mixed now, sand eels, and now it's switching back to sort of half and half uh, sand eels and sprats. But if I can show this data in a different way, I say we do it on three days and on the top set of pie diagrams, these three here, on the 17th of June, 26th of June, and the 2nd of July, that's this year, we have separate statistics for the, the, the day, and we can see that early on, when the chicks were very small, they were largely being fed sand eels, but as they grew, <coughs> more and more clupeids were brought in. So a bit of a half and half here, by the end, by the time the chicks are, are big and getting closer to flying, they were mostly being fed clupeids. Third group, the, the, the gadoids are things like uh, sayed, whiting, cod, that sort of fish, but very few are brought in to rosetur nests. And obviously, there's always a few we can't identify, and it's not because we can't see the fish, it's that the, the parent comes in so fast, straight into the box, and we didn't get a chance to, to, to register what the fish was. I know something was delivered, but we can't tell exactly what it was. So that's the three days. They tell different stories, but when you lump it all together, you see the cycling of, of the two key species. We did a few watches for common terns this year, and their diet is much more varied. You can see the pie slices are, are more similar, but over time, again, clupeids became more important later on. So, but the, a little more variability. But we need to do more work on the common terms. We've kind, they kind of get ignored a little bit. We, we've always focused on, on, the, on the rarest species, rosetern. I hope this is, I think this is the last of the horrible graphs, but what, what I want to show here, this is all rosetern and why boxes are so important. 
the, the, the rosy tern, I say, it does like nesting under cover, and that's why they took to nesting in boxes so readily. That most of them would nest either under vegetation or under rocks, in, in under cracks, crevices, and whatever. And that sort of habitat on Rockerville was so limited. But by adding the boxes, we've created suitable habitat. And if we plotted the weather statistics, we would show that summer are, are wetter and stormier and windier than they used to be 20 or 30 years ago. So that the boxes are really doing a good job of keeping the chicks and eggs warm and dry, you know, and preventing the worst happening to them, them chilling and, and whatever, being blown away. And they sometimes give them a bit of protection from predators as well. So what we've done in these graphs, they look very complicated, but we're just trying to show that those birds that nest in boxes, this lot, all were start nesting earlier. Now, this is the day of the year, starting in January the 1st as one, and Christmas would be, you know, 350 off this way. So the box nesters start laying eggs earlier than the ones out in the open. And that's an, another one showing the same thing, that the boxes, Sorry, not the boxes. No, it doesn't. I'll forget that one. We'll, we'll go back. Sorry, number of eggs laid. Yeah. In boxes, we always get like this. More eggs. The clutch size is larger in boxes. The brood size is larger in boxes than the number of young fledged nesting attempt larger with the box nesting pairs. So we have this consistent gain for being, for nesting in a box. You might say, I say we put out 900, but we have 1,700 pairs of turns. So there's always eight or 900 pairs of roseates choosing quite often to nest in the open. But when they do make that, make that choice, they generally raise fewer young. So, you know, one of the big questions for us is, can we make more of the population nest in, in boxes. And I, I'm not sure we can. And if we compare that with what's going on at the other two colonies at Coquit and at Ladies Island Lake, there virtually all their rosy turns nest in boxes. It, it's very rare that one nests outside a box. So they, they often have very good breeding every year and most of the birds are in boxes. But remember, the size of their colonies are very much smaller than Rockerville. And I'll show you a table with, with that in. These are the, the two other colonies on the left-hand side here. This is Ladies Island. This is it early in the season. It is, it's, it's a coastal lagoon with an island in it, very flat. At the beginning of the season, it's been covered in, in, in water and vegetation has rotted away and it's a fairly brown place. And the wardens there put out, you know, a couple of hundred boxes for their birds. And at the moment, they have over 200 pairs of rosy terns nesting here. Later on in the summer, the vegetation grows up a bit and looks more, more green. And obviously the, the boxes are plastered with a bit more bird poo. And the warden puts out marker poles to, to show where the nests are. I could show another one where the, the, you can't see the boxes. But they're covered in vegetation and the marker poles tell the wardens where they are. On the right-hand side, it looks a little bit more like Rockerville, but Coconut Island, again, it's, it's, it's a big island. It's pretty flat. But the wardens there have tried to make it look as close to Rockerville as they can. And they put the boxes out in, in terraces on a sort of gravelly substrate and they're trying to keep the vegetation controlled. So it really does look... I wouldn't say the spitting image, but it looks very like Rockerville, and the birds have reacted as if it was Rockerville. The numbers have gone up. Quite a lot of Rockerville young birds go and nest on Coquit. So when their population started recovering and climbing, because more birds from Rockerville were immigrating into that English colony. But now, whatever we are, 10 or 15 years later, more and more coca birds 
are are returning to coca to breed and that the influence of the rockable birds is diminishing over time. But again, both colonies are doing very well and they are increasing. <coughs> a couple of shots here. This is from the top of the lighthouse when the, the keepers do come out now and again. And when they let us up the lighthouse tower, we can get this lovely bird's eye view literally of, of our colony. And this is what Rockaby looks like in the middle of the season. It's chock a block with boxes. You can see hides, so there's one here, there's one here. Rows and rows and rows of boxes. These are the areas of the island the birds love. The, the west facing side of the island. If I turned 180 degrees around and faced east, there'd be far less ro rosier turn boxes. Those parts of the, of the island, the east side, are more dominated by by common terns and arctic tern. And I, I said that, but th this area here, what we call the front garden of the house, this is all common terns. We have about one or two pairs of, of roses nests here and occasionally under the bushes or something. Virtually all, there can be two or 300 pairs of common terns in that area. But this is slightly to the left of the other shot and another hide and terraces and row after row of rosier boxes. So, so, so summing up that information on the islands, we've got Rockabill, the, mid, the middle one is Copit, and the right hand one is Ladies Island Lake. Three pretty different islands, but lots of similarities, but quite a few differences. And I've tried to tease them out here a little bit. Rockabill is certainly the smallest. Copet, six hectares, it's quite a big place. You know, it can take you 20 minutes to walk to the other end of the island. On, on Rockabill, it takes you about two minutes. Ladies Island, three hectares. Still quite sizable. Rockabill, six kilometers from the coast. Coke, it's about two. And Ladies Island, because it's in a coastal lagoon, it's like effectively inland, and I put minus one kilometers, because the birds have to fly over the lake and out to get to see where they feed. Each of the colonies has a very similar number of turns, all three and a half to 4,000 plus pairs. But in the case of, of Rockabill, we only have three, but the other two, Cocot and Ladies Island, have four species. They have the bigger sandwich turn nesting with them. Okay. Then I've said, do the wardens live on the island? The answer is yes for Rockabill. Yes, for coca, they nest, they live in the in the lighthouse buildings like we do. But at Ladies Island, because it's sort of this small inland island, privately owned, they don't, but the wardens go out every day. They're there they, in the hides, watching the turn, bringing the turn, and so on, doing the same sort of duties as we do. So on roseates, we have about 16, 1700 pairs now. On Cocot, they have about 120 pairs, and at Ladies Island, 250 pairs. So, Rockabilly is about 10 times the size of Cocot and about five times the size of Ladies Island. <coughs> All the islands have other seabirds nesting on them, kittiwakes, on Rockabilly and Black Guillemots, on Cocot. They, they don't have the black guillemots, but they have kittiwakes and they have thousands of puffins. Rock, Ladies Island, they, they don't, I say, they have quite a lot of black headed gulls nest there and quite a lot of Mediterranean gulls. But no, no orcs, that's the, the, the guillemots and, the, and the, the puffins and whatever. But that said, there are always plenty of other seabirds nesting in nearby colonies. And these other seabirds sometimes are important because they dive quite deeply in the sea and they can push small fish to the surface where the terns and the kittiwakes can get at them. Terns and kittiwakes, although they do dive a little bit, they rarely get more than a, a few inches into the water. So they have to get fish at the surface more or less. And I say diving species of seabirds like guillemots and puffins can drive up fish to the surface 
and it's also done by things like whales and dolphins and, and that does happen as well at Irish colonies that are our, our porpoises are bottlenose dolphins and sometimes whales bring fish up to the surface where the turns can now looking at, at troublemakers for turns I've said gulls are, are, have a rather negative effect on Rockabill. We don't allow the big gulls to nest on the island. So if they do start nesting, we remove their nests, hopefully before they lay eggs. But generally, they've got the message that they don't bother nesting, but they just hang around and try and steal turn eggs. Does this happen elsewhere? It probably does. But the, the other two islands, because they're close to the mainland, they have far more problems with mammals than we do. Our six kilometers offshore usually means we don't get any mammals other than seals and whales and dolphins anywhere near the island. But unfortunately on Cocot, they've had problems with the odd rat and an otter on the island. And at Ladies Island, which is obviously enclosed by the mainland, They've had problems with rats, mink, pine martens, and, and so on. So the predators cause them a lot more problems. Perhaps we get more trouble from gulls than they do. So it, it balances out a little bit, but it, it's hard to get rid of the rats and otters. And that's another talk, and I'm not going to give it tonight. And now I've said a little bit about people problems. On Rockabill, fortunately, we, we don't have any. Occasionally, we get some people who will come up, fishermen or or people on jet skis and land on the island and want to have a picnic or something. And we politely say, no, you can't do that. It's a, it's a reserve for the ferns during the breeding season, come back in the winter. So generally speaking, most people accept that because they know how important it is for turn. Unfortunately, there's a, an egg collecting fraternity in Britain that we don't really get here in Ireland. So people are trying to sneak onto the island in England and steal rosy turn eggs. So that does happen and it means they have to have a warden who stays up all night guarding the rosy turn colony, preventing anybody from landing and trying to steal eggs. We've possibly had cases of this in Ladies Island because it's much easier to get to. But it, generally speaking, it's not an issue. And then here I've said something. Rockabilt, there's virtually no space for anything else. Cocot is a, is a big island, but it's occupied by lots of other species, mostly puffins and, and black-headed gulls. And Ladies Island is somewhere in between. There is a bit of space, but there's still a lot of other terns there, sandwich terns, and a lot of black-headed gulls as well. So maybe... They have more room for growth than we do, but Rockerville is certainly full. So that's the, the end of the, 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 the detailed stuff. They, the key difference is Rockerville is further offshore. We don't have sandwich turns. We don't have any terrestrial mammals that would eat eggs and chicks. There's no real history of human interference, and we have very little space left. You know, the colony is up there at three and a half thousand pairs, and we can't really see it getting much higher. The others, there could be differences in fish and so on, but generally speaking, we think they more or less eat the same sorts of things. Perhaps coconut, they're more dependent on sand eels, but that, that's another story. Now, just a few random slides, just to finish up. I won't be too much longer, a few more minutes, but everybody wants to know what's it like, where, where do we live? This is what it's like after the house has been totally renovated and upgraded 15 years ago. It's a hell of a lot more shabby now. So that nice glossy paint is, is not there. The plaster is flaking off the walls and whatever. So it doesn't look quite as though it did. It did years ago we do try to make this comfortable as we can but it, it does deteriorate even if it's kind of locked up for eight months of the year you know in, in a very damp environment a few other things where where does the power come from the the lighthouse is actually run on a big set of solar panels and we use a little 
a little diesel generator up to up till 2020. So we, we would be hand pulling a generator to give us a bit of electricity in the evening to have some lights to power the phones and the computers. This year, we fortunately got access to the backup generator for the lighthouse. It's a, it's a bigger diesel generator and it starts at the flick of a switch other than a lot of pulling on, on a bit of rope. So this year's wardens had a really easy time compared with the, the 30 years of wardens that went before them, who, who were stuck with more primitive sources of power. Yeah, we do, we do have a shower and you, you, you had a glimpse of it there. But quite often in the summer, we, we, we don't bother using the shower too much. We jump in the sea if we're getting too hot or we're too smelly. So we, we do a lot of swimming on the island. And the smallest room in the house or outside the house is this one. The kitty wakes, I haven't said much about them. They nest on, on the small, relatively low cliffs all around the island, particularly on the bill, the bottom right hand shot here is the bill. <coughs> and we can see little clusters of kitty wake nests at various parts on the cliffs here. These birds actually aren't nesting, they're just sitting about. But there's a group nest here, a group here, and another one here. And this is a, a, a similar colony on the bill, it's, sorry, not on the bill, on the rock, where they're pretty well packed in. And this is pretty late in the season, getting towards the end of July, early August, when the chicks are as big as the adults and more or less ready to go. So these are the chicks with a black line on their wings and their little collar. And the adults are the cleaner looking birds. <coughs> the black guillemots, they are a, a whole a crevice, whole nester of which there's not, not an awful lot on the island. But we over the years have, have been ingenious at making guillemot nest holes and we do it in several ways. There are some, I would say, natural holes in the walls of the lighthouse buildings, and black guillemots nest in these sort of holes here. But then again, we make a lot of nest boxes. They're a bit bigger than a rosy turn box, and this is a cluster of boxes underneath the heli deck on the island. So we have about ten or fifteen pairs nest under the heli deck, and then also modified some of the sort of old windows and holes and some of the outbuildings, these things. And the black guillemots nest in those, and you can also see some bigger boxes and there for black guillemots as well. And while I'm showing this slide, which is looking at the, the, the north end of the rock from the sort of pier area, this is where most of our Arctic terns nest up here on these rocks here and around here and these are birds that have moved over from the bill which is behind me when i'm taking this photograph and abandoned that because the gulls get them and they've come over to the, the relative safety of the rock where we can look at them a bit better they through for the last about five or six years we've had three wardens on the island so there's myself with the 2018 crew Okay, some wardens come out for two or three years. <coughs> Early on, we had one guy work for four summers. We've had people do three years quite often. <coughs> but more often than not, people do one or two years and then they move on to other jobs. But hopefully, thankful for, for their experience on the island. Just a, a, a few shots here of something we did two, two or three years ago in 2018, it was the same year, that we have this horrible tank of stagnant water on part of the island, and it's a death trap for fledgling terns. They, they land in here when they're not looking, and they just can't get out of this horrible green grotty water. And we've had all sorts of attempts with planks to you know make a, a route so that the tern can get out onto this and hopefully scurry up the plank and get out back onto dry land. But it, it just, some years, it's just horrendous. So eventually we decided we're gonna cover it with burn proof mesh. So we had the funding from Europe 
we bought tons and tons of mesh, stitched it all together, carded it down, put it over some support wires over this tank, sealed off any areas around the base. And thankfully for the last three years, we've hardly lost a turn to that sort of pea soup in there. What other birds turn on rock? Well, I have said, mentioned some of the other seabirds that say puffins. We can sometimes have 60 or 70 puffins sitting on the island, but they've, ne they've never attempted to nest. But they nest nearby on Lambe and they like hang around on Rockerville now and again. The top left hand picture there is a, a big flock of knot we had one year that spent summer with us literally. We had sometimes up to a thousand knot, often sitting on the heli deck here or foraging around the edge of the island or on the skyline. Normally, we get two species of waders present throughout the summer, the purple sandpiper and the turnstone. But in the, the early spring, so, soon after we arrive, we sometimes get spring migrants arriving from Africa, landing on the island. They rarely stay more than a day or two, but in this case, we, we've got a spotted flycatcher here, and we quite often get willow warblers and shift shafts and white throats and black caps and that sort of thing out on the island, sometimes some finches. I'm just going to show quickly that these are counts from this year of turnstone and purple sandpiper. So when we arrive in April, we have quite a lot, but the numbers do tend to drop off. And then usually some point in June, they disappear for a very short period. And then they start coming back from their Arctic breeding grounds very early on. So by the end of July, it looks like the spring. So literally the birds here are possibly leaving to go up to Greenland to breed. In some cases, they might fail and come back very early and that's them back here. And then these birds stay the whole winter out on the island until the following late spring when they depart. Lots of people helped with this project. We've had some esteemed visitors, including royalty. Prince Takamoto of Japan came to see us one year, and we have other dignitaries. We once managed to get one of the Ghanaian Wildlife Service guys, a guy called Sammy, came out to see what goes on. He works on roseate turns in winter in Ghana, so he was the first African guy to come out to Rockerville to see what happens to his birds in the summer when they're not in Ghana. So we had great fun with Sammy. We have our, our, our paymasters from the National Parks and Wildlife come to see us now and again, so we're always happy to show them what's going on. We have a guy from Northern Ireland, Jim Wells, a politician by trade, but he's an avid seabirder and loves his turns, and he comes out a lot of years to, to see us, and quite often there's a, there's a nice tray of fresh fruit or some other goodies for the wardens. So Jim love, loves coming out and uh, handing over some goodies to the wardens, watching the turns for another, another chance to watch the turns. So lots of people help us. We've had funding over the years for, from EU Life and Interreg. Irish Lights are very tolerant of what we do on the island. We still own the place. Between ourselves and national parks, we have a lease to use the accommodation and to manage the site for the islands. Our life project ran for five or six years, so it enhanced the funding. This is what allowed us to get a third warden when historically we'd only had two wardens. Some of the team from the RSPB have been very, very helpful to us. And particularly, I'd like to mention Daniel, Chantal, and Paul there on the right. They've been great over the years. We've had life money. I've said the sort of ones Hall of Fame. Here they are, the four year man, Liam Ryan. We've got six now who have got silver medals for three years. And we have three guys and girls who've done two years. And there have been hundreds of volunteers that have come out in the summer and help clear vegetation, repair boxes, do all sorts of things. So we're very grateful to all our helpers. And he, at the moment, is funding from National Parks and Wildlife Service, those who are presently in the Department of Housing, and our main go-to man there to keep, keep the money coming in, to keep the wardens, is Conor O'Malley. So we're very grateful to him for his efforts. 
And at this point, I'd like to say good night. I hope you found it interesting. And I hope some questions there. Man, thanks a million, Steve. That was excellent stuff. I think just the sheer amount of work and the, and the sleepless nights in, in the summer. <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention as well two things. Uh, at the, on the RTE player at the moment, there's a program back from the brink. And that has, it's Derek Mooney presenting it, but it has some fantastic, uh, the drone shots of, of the island from this summer. So anyone who's interested, look that up. It's back from the brink on RTE and there's Steve and the team are out there. And then wasn't there, a Andrew Power made a film about the island Rockabill a couple of years ago, which kind of goes through the life of a warden. And that's available to watch online. Um, if you Google, what would you Google? Rockabill, Andrew Power, but- um, Yeah, Crow Crag Productions. Or... Crow yeah, Crag. yeah you, you'll find it, I think, yeah. Crow Crag Productions is the, is the is Andrew's film company. Yeah, and that's a uh, feature length, all about the life of a warden. But there's some great shots, isn't there? Peregrine falcons swoops in at one stage. Um, so we can get down to some questions. But I, I just had a question about the. It's so lush and green in the springtime, and I was just wondering what 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 was it like historically before Birdwatch took over when there was when there would have been lighthouse keeper there would they they would have had a little garden or a vegetable garden or something and they would have kept they would have kept everything in neat and it there wouldn't have been any mallow there or would it would the, just the footfall be trampling it and yeah yeah i mean they, they certainly had their gardens and they they used to grow potatoes and cabbages and whatever else they could so there was what we call a front garden and then either side of the house a lighthouse at the top of the island there were another two gardens so you know yes they would have kept them clear for, for, for growing but remember there were, there were only up to 400 pairs of turns and we we, we do acknowledge that the, the lighthouse keepers have a big role in keeping gulls off the island so a smaller number of turns did nest there and it, it is very puzzling as to, you know where where did they nest and i mean i'd have occasionally come across some very old black and white photographs of what it looked like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, maybe. And I, I, I'm trying to do some sort of comparison of what the habitat looked like then and now, but I haven't got very far with that. That's a job for the long winter nights yeah. to come. But, but it, yeah, we had far less birds. They were around the edge of the island. The keepers would have managed their own the, the, the walled gardens for, for their own purposes, whether or not they allowed a few turns to nest in there, they probably didn't. But this is where, you know, one use has transitioned into another use and us and the turns have taken everything over, you know, really, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, some questions. So um, Laura had a question. What's the management type for the vegetation on Ladies Island Lake? Well, they, they, they cer certainly don't. Okay, they've got a much bigger island and they certainly don't chop all the vegetation the same way we do. It, it couldn't. It's just such a big area. There are some scrubby bits, which they do, you know, grub out with, with mowers and, and, and strimmers and whatever. They, they don't want scrub taking over the island. But the, a lot of the island, and particularly the bit that suppose it turns nest under, or in nest on is actually underwater in the winter and that kills all the vegetation okay so that's why when i showed you that that, that shot it looked quite brown that's after they cut the barrier through to the sea and drain all the winter flood water out to sea they drop the level of the lake the the, the island emerges again and that the vegetation has been killed over the wardens come out get the boxes out I say the vegetation does start growing up through the season and they do clear areas around the, the areas used by the, the roseates and the boxes and whatever so that the wardens be trampling on on chicks you know but it, it's not the whole scale that we give rockabill but, yeah. but remember we don't cut all of rockabill it, it looks as though yeah it's a 
you know, it's a big bit of work, but we, over, over the course of a few days to a week, we cut sort of 80 or 90% of, of that vegetation. But if, if we didn't, I think we would have, you know, 500 pairs of turns, not three and a half thousand pairs of turns. So, yeah. Um, just a question about the, the egg thieves. Um, and what are those eggs actually used for? Uh, it's just a, a collecting must have, yeah. you know, yeah. because it's an, an illegal activity. It's not as though you can put them on display or anything. So the, the, this underground world of egg collectors, I'm afraid it's, you know, there might be a small group in a big area that every now and again they get together and, and you know, in the dark winter nights and go off some of their treasured possessions, but they can't put them out for public display. It's literally self gratification. It's it's so pointless, you know. Um, <clears throat> Lorcan had a question: um, Is has there any been any research into plastic ingestion with the terms? Well, you should let Heidi. She's here. Talk about that. Yeah. Yes. So Hi Heidi's there out in the audience. I don't know whether she can be unmuted. Can she? Yeah. <laughs> I have a cough and she can answer. Hello, Heidi, are you there? How are you? Hiya. Uh, yeah. yeah, so there is a little bit of research on uh, plastics um, in seabirds. Oh, um, rockabilly as well. So whenever a bird dies in rockabilly, I get sent it. Um, and then I do necropsies and look at their stomach contents. Now, I had very few turns um, that actually had any plastics in its stomach. So there must have been about maybe two turns out of like 50 or even more. Um, so for the turns, not the incidence of plastic is not huge. Um, I, um, so I'd say that that's one of the reasons why they wouldn't ingest it as much. Someone was asking about microplastics as well. Does your research yeah. cover that? Yes, yeah. so what we look is, we try to look at, um, we use a sieve that's one millimeter um, aperture. So whatever is, you know, um, up to one millimeter, we take it like as, you know, bigger than one millimeter. Um, so microplastics normally are um, below the five millimeter range. So in that case, we do get a little bit of microplastics um, in our sieves as well. And it's common? Not so common, no, no, not in terms. Um, we do have the other species that ingest a lot more, like for instance, um, the homers and gannets would also ingest quite a bit, um, she waters, uh, but the terns so far seem to be clear. Okay. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, Heidi, are you, are you tempted to go back for another stint on Rockabilly? <laughs> I'm pretty busy now, but um, I love that place. So whenever I have an opportunity to jump in, I do. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. No worries. Um, I, uh, well, I'm, I'm reading one from Joe about how the little turns fed in Kilkool, which wasn't the subject tonight. <laughs> we could perhaps do that later or next year. But no, the, the, the little, the Kilkool little turns had a pretty good year. We had a record number, I think about nearly 220 pairs nesting. Chris Johnston is out there as well. He could answer if he wanted, but maybe not. But anyway, we had about 220 pairs to, of turns nesting. Productivity was, was down a little bit. We had a lot of trouble with roots, taking a lot of eggs. So there was a lot of relaying, but in the end, you know, we think up, up nearly two, 300 young fledged, and we got a, another 150, 160 coloring, and we coloring some about 10, 15 adults as well. So, we, you know, we're making good progress. Uh, all in all, a good year, both Rockville and Kilcool. And uh, uh, you've heard Barrow's story for Dor Dorky already weeks ago. Yeah. Um, have you got the one from back there? Have you any ring reco recoveries from turns in Africa? A, a, yes, but not recently, not that many recently. You know, it became apparent in, in the sort of 
1980s that a lot of terns were disappearing and not coming back from Africa and we were getting quite a lot of ring recoveries of, of young birds in West Africa, mostly in Ghana. The, the RSPB got the funding to send a, sort of an expedition down there and they launched an education program trying to discourage the kids from trapping terns in their spare time, you know, to give, give them a pair of binoculars instead of a trap. And, and you know, work at it that way. And we, we felt it, it, it certainly did work, but we're not totally sure because obviously the, the work on Rockabill and Coca and everywhere was ramped up at the same time and the islands were warden properly and whatever. So the population began to recover. Now, whether it was because there was a diminution of trapping or whether it was because of what we were doing in the breeding grounds, we can never really sort that out. We probably think that the, the big crash in the population in the late 60s, 70s and early 80s was probably to do with overfishing or the failure of the fisheries in West Africa. So that the sardines and things the, the birds were eating down there were either being industrially exploited by big fishing fleets and not available to the turn. So it was more likely a food issue but exacerbated by kids, you know, bored kids after school, if they went to school, trapping turns on the beaches. So we, we still do get a few recoveries, but quite often we found nowadays that the, the recoveries are coming from guys on fishing boats. And we're not quite sure whether they killed the bird or whether they've just caught it because it's been sort of perching on the side of the boat and, the, and they could grab it and say oh look it's got a ring and let's read the ring and oh it says please send to the British Museum and the, and you know the and they report it and obviously with mobile phones and the internet the, the, there's a lot more of that but whether we, we still don't really know whether they're actually killing them and saying this is going to be dinner or whether it's oh this is a lovely bird let's have a look at the ring and let it go again you know we don't, we don't know what what is going on there but obviously all the, all the colonies are increasing and recovering, the, the, the big three. They'll have a lot of problems in our French colonies with, with in some places, rats and peregrines and, and human disturbance. In some places, there were a lot of problems with during COVID, with a lot more people going out in boats and, and disturbing islands, you know, as a way of getting around mm. on, on land, travel restrictions and whatever. So that the French colonies are struggling, they're still hanging in, but they're not doing as well as the British and Irish ones, which are all generally increasing. Have you spent time in Africa yourself? Uh, not, not, not in West Africa, no. So I, I've never been. Okay. I have, <laughs> have to send you down. I have to get funding. Uh, it's that. on my list, but yeah, the COVID sort of. <laughs> Um, what, uh, did you mention the proportion of ring turns that return to Rockabill? Yeah, well, we, well, you could see that of the birds we, we've sampled as adults, 96% of them are from Rockabill. Okay. But the vast majority come back to the site they were born at. They, 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 there were the same statistics for Cocot showed a much lower percentage of cocot raised young that's over time has increased so more cocot young recruit cocot than birds emigrating from rockerville mm. but uh, still the odd one does go there yeah that they all that they all obviously all know all the colonies you know that before they head south to africa i think they all fly around and check all the other colonies and whatever or when they're coming back have a look at them all and but generally speaking they end up where they were born you know where they hatched and um, is there any colonies on the west coast julian was asking no, no. Colonies. well there, there are common terns and arctic terns but, yeah. but no roseates we've had a couple of cases in kerry where odd pairs have nested we've we've tried putting out boxes to encourage it a bit more but it's never been sustained and in the earliest turn surveys we did in the 80s, again, there was a handful of 
pairs, you know, nesting as odd ones and twos in common or Arctic tern colonies in Connemara, occasionally the odd one in Donegal. So they, they did seem to be a few more willing to have a go, but over the years, it, everything is just owned in to, to Rockabill and to a lesser extent to Ladies Island Lake, and they don't look anywhere else now. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's good and bad things that, you know, you have all your eggs in one basket that makes them more sensitive to some catastrophic disturbance at those sites. But I, I just can't see a way of us getting, you know, you know, 10 or let alone 100 colonies, each with a few of each species. I just don't think it's going to happen. That, that there's so much human activity you know, and the, and the the managed East Coast colonies tending to grow, the West Coast ones are staying relatively small, but ho hopefully, you know, producing enough roots to, to at least keep viable common and Arctic town colonies there. But, you know, yeah, a few have nested on the West, but not many. We've had a few nesting in Borky and they're, there were a few a few sites in Northern Ireland in Carlingford, Strangford Lock and Larn Lock, but at the moment we only have a single pair in Larn Lock. Yeah. And have you got your eye on is there any potential on the East Coast? Have you got your eye on any sites now that Rockabill is at maximum capacity? Full. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'll never say it's totally full, but you know. I'll, we have been trying literally for a, a long period, you know, 20 plus years to get more roseates to nest at Dorky. We, we, you know, we've had temporary success that uh, one year I had 11 pairs nest there. Quite a lot of years I had one or two pairs and one or two years I had a bit more than, you know, sort of three or four, but we just haven't been able to sustain it. But the birds, drop in and have a look now and again, but we just can't get them interested. And yeah, they talk here. I mean, you've had the story from Tara it started off as a very much a mixed common and Arctic colony. The numbers that declined, we've got a few roseates in, declined a bit more, and then suddenly we've had a resurgence of Arctic turns at the expense of even the common terns, that a lot of the common terns disappeared and the last three years it's been mostly Arctic terns, but we're seeing a few more common terns come in now. But, you know, and, and uh, you know, we have, we have various platform colonies in Dublin Port, which are mostly common terns. Again, bird watchers have picked out the odd rosy tern landing there, but they don't seem to show any real interest. And, you know, that what we do know about their feeding behavior is that Rosie is a, a much more pelagic bird. So it's happier on Rockabill out there in the middle of the Irish Sea, close to the deeper water. It spends a lot of its time foraging a long way out to sea, whereas the other birds might forage more in the inshore environment, the Arctics and the commons. You know, so it, it tosses for courses, but. Let's say Ladies Island, we could do with understanding a bit more about their feeding behavior. And it's the work is planned, but hasn't been carried out yet because they're, they're, they're an odd one. They're, they are obviously close to the coast. Where, where are those rosy turns going to feed? You know, we can watch them a certain amount from the land, but you never get the whole story. You know, being on the beach, the telescope, looking out at sea, you can say, yeah, there's a rosy turn. I think it's a couple of couple of kilometers offshore but after that you can't see them so we don't really know where to go and we'd have to do some sort of tracking or tagging to follow those birds and see how far they are going out to sea to feed. And this is a multi-part one but um, is there an ample supply of food for them and the question there's a question about it, will climate change affect the food supply overfishing and rising sea levels. Yeah, a lot, lot, lots of little bits in there. The okay, you, you, you've seen the graphs of what of what the 
the terms are reading over nearly 30 years there and they haven't changed that much. And I mean, the, the, the good news is that if we, if we put climate change to one side, we don't have a commercial fishery in the Irish Sea for those small fish at the moment. There have been occasional attempts, you know, in, 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 in the last 40 or 50 years to, to start doing these sort of industrial fisheries and this is for, for making fish meal and animal feed and things like that but in the North Sea various countries Denmark Holland Scotland they will industrially fish sand eels for for, for non-human food reasons and that can have a very negative effect on the seabirds nesting in those areas we haven't got that in the Irish Sea, fortunately. So generally speaking, the things that the terns eat aren't being fish. They are also eaten by bigger, bigger seabirds and uh, cetaceans and seals and so on as well. But, uh, but at the moment, there seems to be a good colony. When the productivity is low, it seems to correlate more with poor weather than it does with a lack of fish. But because we have no fishery statistics, we don't really know. And I mean, in theory, it should be if the turns do badly, it's probably because of the poor, poor food supply. We don't think that's due to fishing. It might be due, due to natural fluctuations in the in the prey population, or you know, poor breeding success by those fish themselves. They spawn in the in the late winter. The, the, the young sand eels and sprats and things spend a lot of their, their early days under, under sand in the seabed. And then when they're a sort of eatable age for terns, that, that's the early summer, when the terns start catching them. But the, most of the ones they bring in are, are fish. Yeah. <coughs> so we haven't had a crash in food. There are other studies showing that with climate change, that the plankton that in the sea getting warmer, the, the plankton are changing. So the, the fish are kind of staying the same, but they're eating those fish that eat the small fish that eat plankton are eating different species of plankton. And some of those that tolerate warmer water generally are less nutritious. So there's a lot of work done in the North Sea. On, on their seabird colonies, and they've shown that the, that the energetic value of, of sand eels is only about half of what it used to be 20 or 30 years ago. So that's because the, the small fish are being raised on poorer quality food, and there's less fat and goodness in them for the seabirds to eat. So that, that's a, a definite climate effect. We also know from, from wider scale fishery statistics that new fish are appearing in, in northern waters around Britain and Ireland. So things that would be very rare, like anchovy and sardine, are becoming more common on the south coast and in the English Channel and the Southern North Sea. And they, they are species that terns can eat. So it, it'll be fascinating to monitor it. Uh, you know, we might see our birds bringing in anchovies and sardines rather than sprats and sand eels. But hopefully the energy content is good and the, and the, the colonies will continue to thrive. But, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, I'm afraid. <laughs> I have an empty cup of tea. So, yeah. But, uh, the rising sea levels as well, is that, how does that going to affect <laughs> Rockerville? Well, uh, Rockerville is quite a steep, rocky island. So I wouldn't be too worried for another 50 years, maybe. Okay. I would be more worried about Kilcool and the little terns nesting on the beach mm. because their, their, their space is really getting pinched. At the moment, we haven't seen a, a, a loss of surface area. I have said we get stormier summers on Rockerville and the kittiwake nests get washed off their, the, the cliff nests very often by big seas in the middle of summer, which you know 30 years ago it didn't happen anywhere near like, like what it happens now. So yes, we might get some, but generally speaking, the biggest seas are in the, still in the winter. So 
I wouldn't be too worried about Rockville for a little while, but as I say our, our coastal ones, the, the little turns, yeah, I am very worried. Okay, well, you said you've got an empty cup of tea, so I was just one last question. The, the first one in the chat there, can you see that from Stephen McAvoy? Has there been any studies on the correlation between productivity and nesting su success with those chicks return to breed in later years? So, sorry, I can't see that one. I missed the beginning of it. Can you repeat that? Sorry, I'm looking for it now. Where are we? The very first question, has there been any studies on the correlation between productivity and the nesting success when those chicks return to breed in later years? And this was in relation to the slide with the blue line going up and the red, the waggly red line. Yeah. The, the, this is something that we really want to, to look at. We have an incredible amount of information, but I, I'm afraid that, that, that it's a, sort of a lack of, of staff and computer time in the winter, that we would love to look, look at what a bird does over the course of its life. You know, we, we've showed how old, <coughs> how long they can live and whatever, but we don't tend to study the same bird from year to year. We, we are, we are unfortunately, unfortunately, as, as, as the way our funding runs, that we have to produce an annual report. How many have we got? How well have you done? What have they eaten? Da, 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 da. And that's delivered for the, for the 2021 study. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be lovely, and we have, we have, we have tried, and we, we, we are still trying to get a senior researcher free enough to to do a study where they look at birds over the course of the lifetime, you know, does a bird from a certain air raised in a certain year, are its chances better or lower than the following year, depending on whether they were raised in a, in a good year or a bad year. And there are lots of other studies that that sort of effect can happen, that if you were raised in a, in a if you were successfully raised in a, in a poor year, you might do better than being raised amongst a lot more birds in a in a good year. So good and bad can mean different things, but it's something we are really looking forward to doing. We have the data, but or we have a, a good bit of data, but we take a lot of sorting and picking out to tell that story. But we we are aiming, you know, and I'm, I'm literally at the moment we're trying to get a, a postdoctoral researcher. To work on stuff like that so yeah plenty of scope plenty of scope That's yeah it. lots and lots to lots of unanswered questions and play <laughs> <hours. laughs> um okay it's 20 coming up to a quarter to nine now so thanks everyone for coming to the talk tonight giving up your time thanks a million to steve for giving his time i know he's he's busy so getting it all together and yeah excellent work steve thanks you've got your work cut out every year um but the turns i think you know i couldn't think of any safer pair of hands for them to be in so many many more seasons hopefully and continued success with the project yeah fingers crossed that's it we'll be there next year yeah <laughs> Yeah, oh, I miss the place like mad in the winter. It's yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a question quickly there. Do, apart from Ireland, UK, and France, do rosy terns breed anywhere else? And, and yet, yes, they breed in the Azores, and they breed over in North America, in New England, and 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 Southeast Canada. And then the next colonies are in the Caribbean, and there is a few in in the Eastern Cape and South Africa. And then they become a bit much more tropical species nesting in in the Seychelles and over in, in on the Great Barrier Reef and and sort of part of the world. So they are, they are a pretty cosmopolitan species. They're supposed to be a tropical species or a subtropical species, but really on on Rockville, they are at the very edge of their range, and that's you know where I think the box has become so important. That from our summer weather yeah anyway enough from me yeah
Brilliant. Okay, so thanks a million, Steve. Um, this will be available to view on YouTube as well, if anyone miss, missed anything. And we'll be back with more Birds Connect talks. The next one is on Garden Bird Survey and Brian Burke's doing that at the end of next month. So thanks a million. Thanks again, Steve. Good night, everyone. Welcome. Good night.